Welcome everyone to our Aspatuck Lunch and Learn series. Today we were very proud to have Kim Ironman from Eco Beneficials with us today to share with us ways we can create successful blooms in the native garden. My name is Jean Stetzbachowski and I'll be our host for this afternoon's lunch program. I'd like to start by reviewing a few details about our Zoom program and how we'll be collecting questions for the speaker. We will, if you notice, there's a toolbar at the bottom of your screen, and you'll notice both a chat feature and a Q&A. Feel free to enter questions in throughout the program because we will be taking all of the questions at the end. So we'll curate them during the presentation, and after Kim is done, we will be uh, taking about 15 or so minutes to work with a Q&A. We will not be using the hand raise function today, letting everybody people know that chat and Q&A is the way we're going to go. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mary Ellen LeMay, Director of Landowner Engagement at Aspatuck Land Trust, who is responsible for land stewardship and outreach to our Aspatuck members and the community at large. Hello, Mary Ellen. Hello, Jean. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for uh, being our, um, our host for today. Um, and I'm very excited to have uh, Kim Ironman here. Uh, she is just very well known. And before I, uh, we're, we're just so honored because it's an important time to have her speak to us about the, you know, how critically important our native plants are and how to create a succession of blooms. So while people are, are coming in now for the first um, two minutes, I'd like to take this opportunity to share with you a very brief uh, video that's just a little over two minutes. Um, and it is a, um, a video that we made, it gives people an overview of the Aspatuck Green Corridor and the Aspatuck Land Trust, what we're trying to do. And it's important to understand from this video um, what we can do in our backyards to improve biodiversity. And Kim's talk today is going to be a critical part of that um, in terms of the focus on native plants. So introducing native plants, um, Avoiding pesticides and rethinking your lawn are the three things that we're telling people to do to become a green card or partner. And so I'm just going to start this video and let people um, sit for like two minutes and, and understand we've got our uh, friend uh, Doug Tallamy's in this video. I'm going to share my screen. And uh, begin share. Okay, and uh, oh, can you see, let's see, it's sharing my screen, but it's not the right screen, is it? Can you see the um, video? It says it's got a fern on it. You are all set, Mel. Okay, good. So I will press start and we can enjoy. Imagine a Fairfield County where the beauty of our land is preserved where birds and insects flourish and natural species thrive, where people have more preserved lands to enjoy, drinking water is pure and flooding is diminished. Here at Aspatuck Land Trust, we are making this happen and encouraging others to support our Green Corridor mission. Part one of the Green Corridor is protecting land. We are preserving strategically located land parcels in our six town region by either purchasing them or receiving them as donations. So far, this includes 42 parcels and over 800 acres of land. Among those are Gilberti's farm and the Fromson Strassler property in Weston, where we are creating a 705 acre forest block on the Weston Wilton border. Part two of the green corridor is land stewardship, encouraging homeowners to keep their backyards sustainable. We are controlling the plants that are on our land. And right now we, we vastly favor giant lawns. We've got 40 million acres of lawn in this country. That's the size of New England. Uh, and, and particularly the way we treat our lawns, that's, that's a deadscape. Our lawns don't provide food webs that support all the other things that we, we need. So what we want to do is re-landscape our yards. I suggest we cut the area of lawn in half, put in the plants that support the food webs and the pollinators, and create uh, what we, we call biological carters that connect the 
actual habitats so that the plants and animals in those habitats not only can move back and forth between habitats, uh, but they can actually live outside those habitats. Now, the Green Corridor Initiative from the Aspetuck Land Trust uh, is organizing an effort to create the biological corridors that, that we talked about. Of course, the corridor will be much more effective if everybody joins up. If you have holes in it, that's, you know, that's an obstruction. And it, you know, it's not hard. Put that oak tree in your yard. And, and instead of the ginkgo. And all of a sudden you've got connectivity with, with migrating birds and countless other species. We are in a critical moment in time to save our species and protect our natural lands. Insect populations have declined by 40% since the 1970s, and we've lost 3 billion birds since that time. And as population growth swells in America's suburbs, so does harmful development. Creating a greener planet starts with greener suburbs and greener backyards. Okay, everybody, thank you very much for um, taking the time to listen. And uh, the Green Corridor is, uh, is a uh, very strong partner with the Pollinator Pathway um, and our recommendations are the same, what we're telling people to do. So we're very much uh, in cooperative venture. And um, as I uh, uh, let Kim uh, load her slides, I wanted to first thank Jean stetz Pochalski, who is a great friend of and longtime member of the Aspetuck Land Trust. Um, and she's the principal of individual differences at work, um, leadership and coaching. And she has just been, her uh, expertise in Zoom has been super valuable for us uh, as we go forward with a lot of these lectures. So thank you, Jean, for that, um, for your participation today. So um, without further ado, I would love to uh, introduce our speaker today. Uh, Kim Ehrman uh, is the founder of Eco Beneficial. Uh, she's an environmental horticulturist and ecological landscape designer specializing in native plants. She's based in New York and she teaches at the New York Botanical Gardens, Brooklyn Botanical Gardens, the Native Plant Center in New York and Rutgers Home Garden School and several other institutions. Um, she's an active speaker nationwide on many ecological landscape topics. Um, she also provides horticultural mm -hmm. consulting and landscape design to homeowners and commercial clients. Um, Kim is a certified horticulturist um, through the American Society of Horticultural Science. And Kim is an accredited organic land care professional, um, a steering committee member of the Native Plant Center and the member of the Ecological Landscape Alliance and Garden Communication Communicators International, excuse me. She's also the author of this new book, The Pollinator Victory Garden, Winning the War on Pollinator Decline with Ecological Gardening. And, and uh, a, a shout out to Kim for her help in helping me to curate the plants for our Aspetuck native plant style. She was just uh, a, a great uh, mentor in helping me to understand and spell everything correctly, most <laughs> Um, so um, thank you. Without further ado, I would love to introduce our speaker, Kim Ehrman. Hi, guys. So think fireman. Think fireman. fireman. Kim Ehrman. Um, thank you so much, Aspeduck Land Trust uh, and Mel. I, I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, our conversation started when I found out that um, you were having this amazing plant sale. And so I hope I'll inspire those of you who are local to partake in that sale as a result of uh, this talk. Uh, now, it's always great to follow Doug Tallamy. I have that privilege every and now and again, even on video. Um, he is definitely an ecological hero and make sure to pick up um, his books, um, both Bringing Nature Home and the latest one, Nature's Best Hope, um, to get more information. And um, I am all there, uh, all in with the message of losing the green desert. That's what I call the uh, lawn. It is an ecological wasteland. So this spring, start to think about the areas that you can start to remove uh, with these wonderful native plants. 
Um, now, there's a lot of information available to you on my website, ecobeneficial.com. It's going to be relaunched next week with any luck um, and look even more beautiful, I hope. But there's a lot of information there, including a whole uh, section on the Pollinator Victory Garden with plant lists. And I understand that some of you who are uh, attending today may be from states outside of the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, tri-state area. And if you are, take a look at my uh, plant list for your region uh, on my website. So uh, let's get started. Well, why are we even using native plants? I'm not gonna get into this too much because you guys are already here. You probably have some ideas, but they're essential to ecosystems and food webs. And they've co-evolved with other species that may depend upon them and may not be able to survive without them. Without some of those native plants, some species just vanish. So you know about this one. This is the, uh, the classic example of uh, an evolutionary connection that's very limited. Uh, this is a monarch uh, caterpillar. Uh, they are obligate feeders on milkweed or Asclepias species. Guess what? This common milkweed is for sale in the um, plant till we're going to be uh, mentioning even more as we go along. And uh, if you let that happen, uh, guess what you get? You get these beautiful adults, but you also get tons of other pollinators um, and beneficial insects that will be feeding on plants like this. Now of note, um, we really should be thinking about these things and caring about these things. Um, the monarch is kind of the tip of the ecological iceberg as far as uh, my thinking goes. Uh, there's so many other species that are at risk, but um, just in case you didn't see the report from last week, the Eastern monarch population uh, that uh, overwinters uh, in Mexico, that population is down by 26% this year. So the more that we can do on our end um, and, hey, support the conservation efforts in Mexico, their obligate habitat for the eastern population. Um, so support those conservation efforts with dollars and support um, monarchs and all of our um, invertebrates with um, your, your plantings. So here's some best practices um, for choosing native plants. Well, really finding natives that are native to your eco region is best practice. This is sometimes hard to do uh, because your nursery garden center may not be offering <clears throat> eco regional plants, but um, explore the native plant nurseries, explore the native plant sales like the Aspetuck Land Trust sale where you've got that opportunity. And I wanna give a shout out to straight species plants, those that exist in nature without man uh, selecting them, uh, breeding them, hybridizing them in some odd way. Straight species plants give us the best genetic diversity and that is one of our greatest tools in the face of climate change. And when you're choosing native plants, don't forget about the trees, the shrubs, the vines, those woody plants. They're very important for many different reasons. Um, and then also include the showy ones, the flowering perennials, but don't forget the grasses and the sedges and related plants. So other best practices, if you can get local ecotypes, locally co collected seed, which is the case with this particular sale, that are locally and organically propagated, that is as good as you can do. And that is a fantastic bar that we have finally started to reach and always buy plants that are gonna be appropriate for your site conditions. So here is um, some information on the grower that has grown out these local ecotypes um, for the Aspetuck Land Trust sale. Now they've, uh, they've engaged botanists in the region to go out and wild collect, and then they are producing these wonderful plugs. And if you've not bought native plant plugs, you've been missing out. Uh, that is a vast majority of plants that I am um, uh, using with my clients that are perennials, um, not woodies, the vast majority I'm using as plant plugs. Don't be afraid of little plants. It's all about the root system. And within a growing season or two, you're going to have a completely mature plant, even though that little plug may seem tiny to you. So this is a huge step in the right direction. And no matter where you are based, um, if you are outside of our New York Connecticut and New Jersey region, um, you can start uh, asking uh, local growers to get on this, uh, this type of effort and to do this too. So we're talking about succession of bloom today. And believe me, I wanna tell you about everything, but I've got to limit it because we have limited time. And um, if you're interested in some of these topics, take a look at my classes that are coming up and maybe you'll jump into one of those. But this succession of bloom is really important. 
And uh, one reason is this whole invertebrate decline that we have been facing. Um, we didn't have to have the New York Times put this on the front page to understand it. All we had to do is live long enough and, you know, think back, you know, 20 or 30 years ago when we'd go out on a warm summer night in a car uh, for a drive and we'd have a lot of insect splatter on a humid uh, evening. And uh, now we go out for that same drive all these years later and we just don't see it. So anecdotally or scientifically, this is happening. And of course, um, many of our pollinators and um, our bee pollinators, the uh, most important pollinators in many cases, um, they're in severe decline as well. We have a lack of floral resources for pollinators and the other critters we want in our landscapes, uh, i.e. natural enemies like this uh, lady beetle that is a wonderful predator of uh, aphids. And so a lot of the plants that we're gonna be talking about today um, do other functions other than just feeding pollinators. They may be feeding protein to natural enemies like this. They may be providing a seed source for birds. They may be providing uh, habitat for other creatures um, and especially in, um, in winter. So I'm just gonna give you a shout out about leaving your perennial standing and your native grasses standing through winter and start cutting them back in early spring once the weather starts to warm over 50 degrees and the soil is uh, starting to dry out. So native pollinators have evolved with regional native plants and they might excel at pollinating them. In some cases, they are the absolute best pollinators of those plants. And interestingly, even with our um, pollinators that are not specialists of particular native plants, they may have a strong preference, not only for particular plants, but for local native plants. So think local. And we have this, uh, this evolutionary thing called pollination syndromes. Um, these are good guidelines. They are not cast in stone, but these will give you an idea um, about what type of pollinator will go to what type of plant. I've got a lot of information on this on my website. But pollination syndromes are these suites or groups of floral traits that really influence what kind of pollinator is gonna use what kind of plant. So these things include flower color, flower shape, structure of a flower, the odor, the scent of a flower, absence thereof, and the presence or absence of nectar or pollen. Um, interestingly, not all of our native plants um, provide, uh, flowering native plants provide a nectar source. Some are very important pollen sources, including um, our native roses, our native uh, St. John's worts. And then um, another, uh, floral trait would be uh, nectar guides or the absence thereof, these visible runways to pollinators. Sometimes humans can see them, sometimes not, that lead pollinators like bees and butterflies into the good stuff, the sweet nectar. So here's an example of uh, evolution. This is a hummingbird favorite. This is Minarda didyma. This is scarlet bee balm. This is a great choice for hummingbirds that favor red tubular flowers. They'll go to other flowers too, but this is not a great pick for bees. Um, Minarda, uh, excuse me, fistulosa, while bergamot, which we're going to talk about that's in the sale, would be a better choice for bees. But you got to have a little bit of all of this, don't you? This is one of our pycnanthemum, our mountain uh, mint species. Um, this is a, a wonderful wasp that is a terrific predator on a lot of the pest insects we don't want in our landscapes. Do not be afraid of wasps. We want them in our landscape. Now, I'll just give a shout out. I've got some cool pictures and I neglected to comment. Um, I had two collaborating photographers um, for my book. I took some of the shots, Carolyn Summers and Heather Holm. Um, you may know both of those folks, terrific authors and designers in their own right. Um, and um, some of these images that I'm using are from the book, including this beautiful one by Carolyn and this unbelievably cool and in focus shot by Heather. I don't have the same success she does getting these things in focus. So pycnanthemums, mountain mints, I think we have several species of them in the sale. Um, they are amazing plants and highly deer resistant as are Minardus. So that succession of bloom, it promotes biodiversity. And um, we can feed so many different types of pollinators and so many different species of pollinators and other beneficial insects. And keep in mind, not all of uh, these uh, pollinators uh, or beneficials um, come out at the same time of year or have the same lifespans. They're not active um, uh, throughout the season. In, in most cases, they have different periods when they're active. So the more you can plant, the better off we are. And in a nutshell, having floral diversity allows us to have animal diversity, and that includes insects. So I suggest that you think about creating this ongoing buffet for our pollinating insects and our beneficials. 
And um, it may uh, be a little bit different perspective than you've had um, before. Uh, bedding plants, uh, things that are annuals and are constantly in bloom, really are, that's an outdated uh, mode of design. We need to have some patience. We need to have some anticipation and wait for the next grouping of plants to come in flower and appreciate them for the time that they are in flower and appreciate them for the other things they do in our landscape, including providing really interesting foliage in many cases. So the message here is plant for a succession of bloom. And in this neck of the woods, and for most of our uh, listeners today, that's gonna be from early spring through late fall. And both of those time periods on the extremes are um, time periods we often forget to plant for. So we wanna have a continuous succession of bloom throughout. Another tip, I like to call this achieving floral balance. So that means planting diversely, but planting sufficiently. So planting diversely, we want different flowers, shapes, sizes, colors, and timing of bloom for varied types of pollinators, as I've alluded to. But we also have to plant sufficiently. So some research out of the University of California, Berkeley Bee Lab, found that a one square meter target of the same species of native plant is an ideal target for most pollinators. Now, if you've got a big landscape, that could be very easy to achieve, but in smaller landscapes, it might not be. So do your best, compromise um, to the extent that you need to, but don't be that person that goes to a plant sale and buys one of this pollen, uh, plant, one of that plant, and really confuse um, pollinators, make it hard for them to find and, um, and, su and successfully nectar. So floral targets is one concept. Um, and here's an example. It doesn't have to be all in a big old circle. This is a floral target. Or we can use the meadowscape alternative. So you see that this is a randomly, erratically arranged bloom. And this takes advantage of behavior in uh, namely bees and butterflies of floral constancy. So these creatures may go out dozens of times during the course of a day to look for a single species of plant at a time for each foraging mission. So they will find this verbena, this is in our plant sale, we've got some golden rods too, but they will be able to find that repetition of bloom in a meadowscaper or a full blown meadow. I call a meadowscape kind of a meadow-like garden. So before you choose plants, um, I'm gonna give you a couple tidbits, right? You've got to determine some basic things to purchase plants that are gonna work in your landscape. You gotta figure out the amount of direct sunlight in a given area. How many hours of full sun or not are there? And don't cheat. Invariably, when I ask um, a client to tell me anecdotally how much sun they get, they really don't have a good idea about that. To start looking for the average number of hours of sun throughout the growing season in a given planting area. You also have to know the hardiness uh, and heat zones for plants um, to make sure that they're gonna thrive in your uh, particular location. And uh, sometimes you have microclimates, areas where there is um, maybe some uh, reflected heat off of the house or a fence or whatever, where things are a little bit more uh, warmer, perhaps a little bit more protected, and you can grow things that are marginally hardy um, where you're located. And I, I do that um, in my landscape. Um, also assess wind exposure. Some plants are really tolerant of wind and some like our native hollies hate wind exposure, especially in winter when they can uh, really suffer from uh, leaf desiccation. Do a soil test. I tell everybody who will listen that this is essential um, to figure out what kind of soil you have and what plant type of plants will live there. And this is rarely done. Easily done through your local extension service and things you want to know are the soil pH, the acidity. Some plants like it really acid, some plants like it really alkaline, some are kind of happy campers in the middle. You want to know the percentage of organic matter. The plants that tend to like really lean, dry and fertile soil, they're not going to like a lot of organic matter and that's okay. But some plants, um, particularly a lot of our woodland plants are going to like a pretty good keeping helping portion of organic matter. A minimum is about 3%, 6% even better. Um, Soil texture, yeah. Do you have clay soil that tends to drain very slowly? What plants wanna live in that? Or do you have very sandy soil? You get very fast drainage and some plants really like it well-drained. 
And sometimes it can be a little confusing because um, sandy soil can of, often be wet soil um, for you know, a certain period of time, but that drainage is the key. So think about your soil drainage. Um, do you see puddling in your landscape? Do you have pockets where after a big rainstorm, it just stays puddled? Well, plants that like fast drainage aren't gonna like that. Plants that appreciate wet feet are found in wetlands, they'll be okay with that. All right, and um, gardener's golden rule, I'm sure you've all heard this and boy, we break it all the time. I've broken this many times because I you know, can never get enough plants in my landscape and I'm like, eh, maybe this will live here. And then I find out, mm, nope. So put the right plant in the right place after you do your analysis. And plant, please, especially for woody plants, plant for the mature size, height and width. That is essential so you don't have to keep cutting things back. Other considerations, straight species plants will be variable, unlike the native cultivars you may be accustomed to buying, where you have a pretty good idea about ultimate height and width, et cetera. And uh, this can be a little frustrating uh, because you might be thinking, um, you know, I don't want to plant more than three feet tall, but the straight species might get three to six. So maybe that's not the plant for you. But the height, the color, and even the conditions um, can vary with straight species plants, depending on where they're coming from. As an example, um, most of us here in the Northeast are planting Monarda didyma, that scarlet bee balm, in full sun with enough moisture. I see it, and, and even then, sometimes it gets pretty bad powdery mildew. Um, part sun, it's even more prone to powdery mildew. But um, I've seen that plant in uh, Western North Carolina in almost full shade, streamside, and beautiful bloom, standing straight up without any powdery mildew. The ecotype really does matter. Now, bloom times can be impacted by weather and of course that ugly thing that we know as climate change. I like to call it the climate crisis because it truly is. And you might remember uh, this past June where we had really, really bad um, uh, heat and drought. And a lot of our plants um, stopped producing flowers. They just shut that, that down for a while until uh, they could recover from, um, from the heat. So um, everything is in flux with climate change. The duration of bloom will vary greatly by plant species. You know, you probably all know Echinacea purpurea coneflower. It's got a really long bloom time. It's a nearby native, not native right here, but um, useful in our landscapes. And um, if you've got a small landscape, you want to get some of those workhorse plants in that have a long bloom time. Um, but that's going to vary quite a bit. Um, some of our woodland wildflowers, for example, like bloodroot, you know, they're in flower for a day. That's about it. And think about combining plants together that play well together. Um, think about how a plant grows and you get this information with a little research. Are these plants generally clumpers? They kind of stay put, it may be broadened a little bit or are they aggressive runners or spreaders? So you wanna get like with like. And always remember that native plants are low maintenance. They are not no maintenance. Um, sadly, um, we have gotten um, some misinformation, miscommunication out there in the world that you don't have to do anything with native plants. Well, if you're planting plugs this spring, I guarantee you that if it doesn't rain, you're going to be using the hose because you've got to make sure those roots are established um, with those little baby plants. And once the roots are established, they're going to be um, much, much, much lower maintenance. In a drought, you got to think about supplemental irrigation, but you know, um, if we're buying local ecotypes, they're better adapted to our climate conditions. Problem is climate change is kind of messing with those climate conditions. So let's get into the good stuff. We're gonna talk about plants. So this is a sampling, and I mean a sampling because there's so many more of native and nearby native plants um, to our tri-state area. Let's start with the early to mid spring bloomers. Well, bet you weren't expecting that one. So a red maple is one of our most important early blooming plants for early emerging bees, including um, the non-native honeybee, which this is, some of you may be beekeepers, and um, some of our uh, bumblebees that are, uh, they tend to be uh, tough, can come out in cooler conditions and they can withstand a little rain. So don't forget about the woodies. Many of our, of our early bloomers are gonna be woody plants. Um, here's one uh, that will be blooming in April. This is Amelanchier. This is Shadblow. Um, there are many species of Amelanchier. Uh, this is just one. They tend to be multi-trunked small trees. There is one called running serviceberry that's more 
uh, shrub-like, hard to find, I must say. Um, and these um, are going to be important uh, sources of forage, again, early in the season. Uh, and here is one that is for sale. So when you see my little star up there, my little pseudo asterisk, um, that means these plants are in uh, the plant sale. This is Canada Columbine. I truly love this. I love all these plants. Let's just get that straight. <laughs> but this one is so wonderful to see in the early spring. This is a plant um, that I see being quite variable. Sometimes they're only a couple feet tall. I have a client that has um, last year, her Canada Combine were so happy they were four feet tall. They were crazy big. Um, they vary. They tend to like kind of a part shade condition and they try, excuse me, and they tend to like a soil that's a little bit on the um, drier side to average moisture. They don't like it wet. They won't do well wet. And the way that they perpetuate themselves is they kind of throw seed around. So um, when you're planting native straight species, expect that you're going to get some volunteers. And I welcome that because that's an opportunity. Uh, for more plants, but it's also an opportunity to perhaps dig up some of those volunteers you don't want and uh, share them with your uh, friends and neighbors and family who maybe don't know about all these great natives. So this is a hummingbird favorite and it is our earliest blooming native plant in this region um, for hummingbirds, the ruby throat, when it comes back from its uh, migration. So a great one, a great one, very uh, ethereal looking plant. And there's a close up of this beautiful flower. Now, if you see a columbine with a blue flower, other colored flower, that's going to be a hybrid or some sort of variety of maybe, you know, um, uh, uh, non native species. This is what you're going for. And those hummers are looking for that red. Now, this is an interesting plant that is for sale in the uh, Aspetuck Land Trust sale. And it's one that's usually not offered for sale. So I thought this was really fascinating. This is a woodland plant, a couple feet tall. Its uh, common name is Blue Cohosh, Colophyllum thalectroides. It's kind of a cool plant. You, you have to be a plant geek like me to really groove on the flowers, but they are kind of cool. There they are. Um, but it's a wonderful understory um, plant that's easy to grow in a woodland setting where you get enough. Um, you know, decent moisture, it doesn't have to be super moist and uh, uh, quite pretty. Plant it, you know, when, when plants have flowers that are uh, subtle, it's a good idea to plant them closer to where you're gonna be walking or moving so you can appreciate them. And then um, those flowers will be followed by this very showy fruit, not edible to us, please don't eat any parts of this plant. So that's a really nice one. And um, if you've not ordered it, um, they're hard to find, so get busy. Um, a nearby native, I mentioned this because this is very commonly found for sale um, and it's a wonderful plant. Uh, this is Cercis canadensis redbud. Please try to stick with the straight species, not all the freaks of uh, man-made creations that we see. Now, these are understory plants. These are edge of the wood with plants and they're lovely. They bloom before the trees leaf out. They provide a nice meal to uh, perhaps a hungry bumblebee. And they're really quite gorgeous um, in, the, in the spring, really put on this wonderful show. Um, and uh, here's a close up of a bumblebee really enjoying that. So the red buds that are oddball colors um, for flowers or um, for uh, foliage, I just try to avoid them. Here's one you might not know. We have to think about our spring ephemerals uh, for woodland settings when we're thinking early bloom. This is Claytonia virginica. There are a couple of Claytonia species uh, in uh, this part of the, the country. And um, this is the uh, Virginia one. This is only inches tall. So what is a spring ephemeral? It is a plant that emerges before the trees leaf out in the early spring. It takes advantage of the you know, warm, gentle conditions, not too much sun, just enough, and the moist soil. And they come up and they feed their respective pollinators and then they die back down by summer. Um, and you will see here that these are the nectar guides um, that um, the, the, in, in this case, uh, there's a mining bee that's a specialist on this particular plant. So run out and buy yourself some spring beauty um, if you've got the woodland conditions that this favors, because there's a specialist bee, a mining bee that requires this plant. And we have a lot of these associations. About 25% of our native bee species are specialists on particular plants. Here's another one, Dicentra canadensis, squirrel corn. So this is another spring ephemeral and, uh, you know, kind of comes up uh, in the early spring, uh, under a foot tall, kind of a gentle little uh, plant, feeds those 
uh, bumblebee queens, and then dies back. And then closely related is another one you might see, Dutchman's breeches, another woodland ephemeral, under a foot tall, very gentle plant, um, and um, super important for those mated queen bees that are emerging in the early spring. Um, here is a different type of uh, dicentra. This is fully perennial. Uh, this is another nearby native, um, works quite well here. You've probably seen it um, at botanical gardens and this persists throughout the season. And this is a repeat bloomer throughout, throughout the uh, growing season. It starts in the spring and uh, will bloom on and off until fall. So again, uh, kind of an ecological workhorse um, and something that um, uh, does appreciate um, a little bit more sun than these ephemeral dicentra, but part sun is going to be ideal. Full sun, really not where you want to see this plant. In nature, I often see these fully in the woods, um, but um, they seem to bloom a little bit better if they just get a little bit of sun. And that's a close up of those flowers. Um, Daisy fleabane. I know you're saying, why would I want to plant a fleabane? Well, so many of our native plants have these horrendous common names, so ignore them. Uh, use the Latin. That's the only way, the botanical Latin, you really know what you're getting. But Erigeron philadelphicus, um, our, our flea beans are wonderful pollinator plants and really underappreciated. Um, these will um, be for sale typically at native plant nurseries. They're not commonly found in the average garden center. Um, very open for different types of pollinators. And um, just in case you might be interested, groundhogs like to eat these. So these can be a very good trap crop, a distraction crop for groundhogs if you have a problem. Um, and the annual flea being the same, same thing. Um, our trout lilies, this is another spring ephemeral that you may have seen in, in woodlands. It does like moist soil, um, only inches tall. You'll usually see these beautiful colonies of these. And um, I'm gonna give a shout out for anybody that's really in interested in spring wildflowers of the Northeast. Carol Gracie's book on spring wildflowers is an excellent resource. And she really gets into the science about the pollinators um, and um, uh, culture of these plants. So I can't get into all of that today, but check that book out. She's got a new one for summer wildflowers. I'll be interviewing her about soon. Um, okay, Virginia strawberry for a sunny area to uh, part sun. It really does super well in full sun. It's a tough little plant. Um, so this is a running strawberry, it creates a terrific ground cover, um, about six inches tall, maybe a little bit more um, at max. It's going to bloom, it's going to feed a lot of pollinators, then it's going to fruit. Um, and uh, you can eat those fruits as long as you're not planting this roadside. We don't want to get any of those toxins in our system. Um, but um, a lot of uh, birds and uh, little creatures um, enjoy those fruits too, but fully edible to us. Uh, another spring ephemeral you might be familiar with is Mertensia virginica, Virginia bluebells. And who doesn't love this? Really showy plant, comes up in the spring, dies back by summer, blooms start to fade to pink as it dies back. Um, in a uh, nice moist uh, woodland to uh, you know, shade to part shade setting, part shade they do a little bit better um, in terms of lots of flowers. And these will gently see themselves around, um, you know, over time. They're not aggressive and they are absolutely beautiful and a lot of early pollinators appreciate them. And uh, let's show some love for our um, native spice bush. Very, very deer resistant species. It is a go-to plant for a shade uh, garden um, in a, kind of a woodland setting. Um, these are dioecious, male and female plants. Make sure you're getting both. Um, you're gonna have um, nectar on both the males and females, but pollen only on the males and our bees need uh, pollen to feed their young. So spice bush is a great alternative to that hard plant. The uh, uh, for Scythia uh, that um, is completely overutilized. So what does it do? Well, actually this blooms, and I'm sorry I didn't show you one of those pictures, blooms yellow before the leaves come out um, for some early emerging pollinators, then leaves out, it's a host plant, and then it fruits in the late summer for migrating birds. Oh, there's the, sorry, I put these backwards. That's uh, what happens first, these lovely yellow blooms. I know it's not as showy as for Scythia, thank God, because I cannot stand that plant. So showing a little love to these native woodlanders, um, really important. And uh, Phlox divericata, woodland phlox. We have many different phlox species. This is um, one of the woodlanders as evidenced by its name. Not very tall, about a foot tall or so. Very uh, fragrant, a lovely um, plant. And um, this is when um, genetic um, variety really becomes a factor. So, um, 
I have uh, learned that this is typically a self infertile plant. You need a genetically different plant nearby for cross pollination to happen and for this plant to set seed. So when we are buying cultivars, we are al almost always getting genetic clones. Not every native R, not every native cultivar, but in most cases. So think about you know, what this plant needs to do well. Well, it needs a partner, a genetically different partner. So if you're buying some of this straight species, buy some um, you know, genetically different straight species elsewhere, or you could use a cultivar, but you know, I'm trying to pitch straight species here. This is, um, and by the way, so this, this will uh, really make some nice groupings, but it's much more quiet and well-behaved than this phlox, which really is quite the ground cover. Creeping phlox, eh, it's a little more creeping. Um, and um, whereas the woodland phlox really does quite well in the full shade, this, this a little, a little sh less shade, a little bit of sun, dappled sun will do this quite well and it likes its moisture. Um, very effective ground cover. And uh, I've used this um, to replace in certain areas poison ivy very happily. Um, I'm going to throw one out that you might not know. This is a native plum, Punus Americana. And I'm particularly thrilled to say that the New York DEC for their spring seedling sale made this available. Uh, I am getting 25 of them and I'm going to share with um, uh, family and friends. Uh, if you're one of my friends, give me a call. Hardly ever found, hardly ever available for sale. It has so many of the attributes of um, our prunus in terms of being ecological workhorses. A great host plant for butterfly and moth caterpillars. A great nectar and pollen plant for pollinators. And then fruit that's edible to us and to wildlife. And it's a smaller tree, although um, if you don't prune it up, you're going to create a bit of a thicket um, typically with these. Got lots of native azaleas that are absolutely beautiful. They're deciduous, unlike the ones that we tend to think about. Um, these, the evergreen azaleas are not native. This is pinkster bloom. This is a particular favorite of hummingbirds. Um, and um, you'll see some butterfly action on this too. It's absolutely beautiful plant. This is uh, most of our uh, native azaleas are going to appreciate like a part sun condition and some moist soil and definitely on the acidic side. Um, this will take a little bit drier soil, but not dry, not dry. There's a close up, absolutely incredible plant. Um, pussy willows, super important early source of bloom for pollinators. These are again, dioecious male and female plants by both for the same reasons I shared with you um, before about um, some of our other dioecious species. And these are small trees, but super, super valuable as host plants. They host an incredible number of um, uh, butterfly and moth caterpillar species. And they're really important early in season keep showing honeybees, my apologies, some of those the only in focus pictures I have. Um, Uvularia, again, a nice one for a woodland setting, great Mary Bells, um, so cheery, so beautiful. This clump expands gently over time, you know, maybe a foot and a half tall, maybe a little bit bigger, absolutely charming. It makes me smile every time I see it. And um, don't shun the violets. Violets are so important. Um, not only is it an early nectar source, but also um, violets are host plants for fritillary butterfly caterpillars, which are in trouble because we keep pulling up violets in our landscapes. And P.S. I know we heard some references to your backyard. Hey, now I want you to plant the backyard and the front yard. <laughs> okay, so get these guys in there. And they, this Canada violet reseeds quite prolifically and makes a nice ground cover and really uh, works um, well with some of our other native woodlanders. So moving on to later spring bloomers, um, our aronias, um, you also might see them referred to as photinias, so Latin keeps changing. Um, these are chokeberries. Um, in, um, you know, in Eastern Europe, our chokeberries are quite well known, better known than they are here. These are in the rose family. These are smaller shrubs, you know, expect six feet or so, depending on uh, the genetics of the plant. And um, good early, well, mid season, mid, uh, excuse me, mid spring bloom um, with these beautiful flowers, uh, followed by red fruit on the red chokeberry. Um, and this is black chokeberry. This tends to have a little bit wider habit and it's not quite as upright. Um, and um, go to your local uh, native botanical garden or the native garden section of things like the New York Botanical Garden, you'll see a lot of these. 
So these are fruitful. Um, they feed a lot of pollinators. They have glossy, beautiful leaves and they're fruitful. We can eat the fruit, but not without doing something to it first, like putting some sugar in it. Um, but it's known as a super fruit in Eastern Europe with super high levels of antioxidants. And they're very similar to yeah, those rose family blooms, really nice plant. A nearby native, Baptisia australis, wild blue indigo. These are kind of like big shrubby perennial plants. Um, there is a naturally occurring variety of this called variety minor. And boy, that comes in handy in smaller landscapes. And um, so we'll see these in kind of a, an average uh, moisture uh, situation. And um, uh, it's in the lagoon family. It, it uh, fixes the nitrogen in the soil and improves the soil around it. And it benefits from an application of an inoculant that is specific to the plant. Now, um, deer resistance is quite high on this, except a lot of these plants, when they're um, just emerging in the um, spring, um, you know, they could be nibbled. So you might want to protect them early in the spring um, from deer. A nearby native that is an incredible ecological workhorse tree, smaller tree is the green hawthorn. This is another one that does so many things well. It's a hose plant. It's great for nectar and pollen. It produces fruit for birds. It's great nesting habitat. Um, it likes full sun. It likes drier soil. Happy camper. Different plant altogether, our native wild geranium, geranium maculatum, um, that is more of a woodland plant, a shade to part shade condition, reasonably moist soil, not too dry, not too wet. Um, and it, you'll see those nectar guides. This is also a plant for another specialist bee. And uh, one that um, starting to appear, but not so much, um, which I really love is Hydrophyllum virginianum. This is Virginia water leaf. It's so cool, the foliage all season long, but then you get these crazy blooms that bees just love. And if you go on the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center database, their, uh, their native plant database, you can search by your state, by type of plant, and look for um, plants that are of uh, special value to native bees. They have different types of lists that you can search on. This is, this is on there. Um, a shout out, I hesitate to talk about this because it's so overutilized for the wrong reasons. Ilex glabra, inkberry. Almost all of the ones that we see for sale are genetic clones and they're almost all females. These are dioecious species, all of our native hollies are. You need a male and a female in order to um, uh, get the fruit on the females in order to have the, the uh, pollen on the males specifically for um, some of our pollinators that need uh, that pollen to develop their, their young. So, buy these plants from a native nursery and make sure they're straight species and try to get them to sex them for you when they're in flower so you get the males and females. This is very, very difficult. This is one of my life's goals is to get the word out about this. Um, Ilex opaca, a different type of, and by the way, so these are gonna do well in a lot of sun with uh, moisture, part sun okay, but they get a little bit leggy. This is really an understory tree that you'll see naturally occurring in woodlands. Um, and it can take quite a bit of sun as long as the soil is moist and as long as it's acidic. All of our ilex, our native hollies like acidic soil. Um, and that's what these, and you think, ah, oh, flowers, so big deal, what are they? But just take a look at all the pollinators that visit them. And because this is an evergreen plant, it's gonna be especially important as valuable habitat in winter and a place of shelter. Ilex verticillata. This is a winter berry. Uh, this plant is deciduous. Again, dioecious, again, likes moisture, again, uh, likes acidic soil, um, tolerates um, some, you know, uh, some conditions that are ideal, but, you know, plant it where it wants to be. Um, and the same wonderful blooms. Uh, this, oops, I forgot to tag this. This is in the sale, the Iris Versa color, blue flag iris often found in wetlands, often found stream side or pond side, a couple feet tall, absolutely glorious. And um, if you've got those conditions, um, boy, you're gonna really appreciate that flower show. You'll see them at New York Botanical Garden, um, you know, in the uh, mid spring. Um, something altogether different, because I don't want you to forget about the trees, uh, Liriodendron tulipifera, tulip tree. Um, not a big host um, for butterflies um, and uh, moth caterpillars, but um, you know it does feed um, spice bush swallowtails, for example, and it does feed hummingbirds with those big open flowers, which is kind of cool. Um, Upinus perennis, if you have sandy conditions and kind of rough 
um, infertile soil, um, preferably in sun or part sun, this is gonna do quite well for you. Um, these are very particular in terms of where they wanna live. And um, oops, this is a little out of focus, my apologies. This is for sale um, in the plant sale, Penstemon digitalis, smooth white beard tongue. Um, if you're doing a meadow or meadowscape garden, this is gonna be one of your earliest blooming uh, plants for that uh, meadow or meadowscape. And even though it's not red in coloration, the flowers, um, hummingbirds love these flowers. So do a lot of our bigger bees that are strong that can get in there. Um, easy to grow, full sun is best, so you can avoid the flop. And um, you know, they get pretty tall. They get to th three feet or more tall, um, depending on their genetics. And um, uh, very deer resistant. I Please excuse me for forgetting all the details on these. Um, so that is, uh, that is in the sale, Penstemon digitalis, and a much shorter plant. This is usually, you know, one to two feet, depending on the genetics. This is hairy beard tongue, and this is a workhorse because it can do well in part shade, can do in, well in part sun, it can do well in full sun. It is really a hard worker and beautiful little different coloration of the uh, blooms and loved by all the same creatures that I just mentioned. Um, and rarely offered for sale. Make sure you buy some of those too. Prunus serotina. Um, so this is black cherry, um, underappreciated an ecological workhorse. I'll just say that. Um, but if you don't have room for a big old tree that could be easily 70 feet tall, maybe a choke cherry or Prunus virginiana, uh, kind of a smaller iteration of that plant with many of the same characteristics. Tremendous host plant, tremendous nectar plant, tremendous fruit plant um, for um, birds and uh, some of our other wildlife. And um, thinking outside the big box and nearby native Rus aromatica, don't be afraid of our sumacs if you've got the room for them to, to run. Some of them are more aggressive than others. This is one that's an early bloomer for bees. The other sumacs bloom later. Um, the grow low um, selection um, is one that is supposed to have male and female parts. But this is typically a dioecious plant, and I, I still am not convinced that the um, that the grow low is uh, has both parts to it. But you know, if anybody knows, let me know. Um, but straight species, we're looking for the males and females, and that is the um, the, the uh, inflorescence on uh, fragrant sumac. Very different from our normal sumacs. That's what we usually see, smooth sumacs um, and um, very different in, in for us that some of the other sumacs are going to be blooming later. Tradescantia virginiana, Virginia spiderwort, more of a woodland plant, even though there's a lot of sun on this one. Part sun, probably ideal for this. Interesting, this only produces pollen, no nectar, but uh, an effective plant for kind of a woodsy type of garden. Uh, not particularly big, under two feet. And um, we have a zizia for sale and with Aspatuck. This is one that's a different one. This is Zizia after a heart-leaved golden Alexanders. This is um, one that takes more shade. One is um, more uh, having a more of a clumping nature, a little bit more gentle plant. Very effective. These umbelliferous flowers um, feed a lot of our beneficial insects um, early in the season. This one is for sale. This is Zizia aurea, golden Alexanders. This thing can be a foot tall, two feet tall. I've seen it three feet tall, depending on the weather conditions. If it gets a lot of moisture, which is what it wants, um, it will be really happy. Um, so I see these often planted in dry conditions. That's not where this plant wants to live. This wants it average soil to moist soil is going to be best. And this will happily um, spread itself around. It is not... Um, you know, I would say it's moderately aggressive um, when you're planting it, and a, a wonderful one to include in a wet meadow, early to mid summer bloomers. Um, Allium cernuum, one that we don't often see. This is our nodding onion, and uh, it um, reproduces through bulbet, bulbets. Um, it feeds lots of bees. If you're a beekeeper, you probably don't want onion flavored honey, but a um, couple of feet tall and very effective for dry, hot, and sunny conditions. Um, Totally different plants, Aphlanthus occidentalis, button bush. Where does this guy live? This is kind of a smaller shrub. Um, it's not tiny, trust me. And get up there, you know, expect about six feet at least. Um, but there are a lot of um, cultivars still of this that are quite a bit shorter. But this is a wetland plant. It can live um, actually at the edge of water or immerse from time to time in the water. And so um, be a little careful where you plant this. Echinacea purpurea, nearby native, that is such an ecological workhorse that um, I use this a lot in container gardening. 
because uh, people like to have that long balloon. There's a little skipper eating the good stuff. And we have um, some St. John's worts that are worthy of consideration. This is one that's native to our area. Um, this is really a woody plant. It's kind of a sub shrub, a few feet tall, maybe four feet, depending on the genetics. Um, and another plant that does not have nectar um, as a floral reward, but um, it will be covered with bees looking for that pollen. And there are those beautiful flowers. Um, now, I want you to rethink your hydrangeas. So those horrid uh, blue or um, pink balls of wonder are, consist mostly, those non-natives consist mostly of um, sterile florets. Um, they don't do a darn thing for pollinators. Our smooth hydrangea is an ecological workhorse. I know it's not as showy. It likes kind of a part shade, even a full shade condition. It varies in soil moisture, but average moisture to a little bit on the dry side after it establishes is going to be best. But here's the deal. With this plant, you can see, if you can see my little pointer, and I forgot to use the tool, hold on, let's see, uh, laser, okay. Nope, sorry, didn't work, so I'll ignore that. So on the lower left, you'll see a um, showy floret. That is sterile. That does nothing for a pollinator. What you're looking for are all these little tiny bead-like flowers. They're the ones the pollinators love. That's what we're going for. So think like a pollinator. And um, thinking outside the uh, big box, again, uh, native plants. Um, prickly pear cactus is um, a native plant in uh, the Northeast. It is a, a wonderful plant for hot, dry condition with great drainage and it's showy as all hell. Um, I would suggest that you plant it once and leave it. Don't move it around because uh, it's not that much fun to plant cactus. Um, this is starting to uh, show up for sale in different places. In the winter, it, it's completely alive and it looks dead as a doornail, but it's still going. Phlox paniculata, this is all our tall garden phlox, completely different type of phlox from what we saw before. Um, interestingly, this has a fair amount of shade tolerance. We typically see these planted in full sun with adequate moisture, um, but it'll tolerate quite a bit of shade quite happily. The straight species, uh, typically. Um, some of the cultivars, not so much. Physocarpus pulfolius, going to uh, some of our shrubs. Um, this is common nine bark in the rose family. Again, highly deer resistant. That, that phlox is not, by the way, um, highly deer resistant. Get the green form, skip all those plants that have uh, the cultivars that have those uh, red leaves. Um, you're actually gonna deter chewing from um, insects, which is not what we want to do. We want to, to support our native insects with the plants they feed on. So uh, this, is a, this is a beautiful um, plant and I happily found a naturally occurring um, a variety of this called Nana, which is a dwarf. Um, not easy to find. So there's beautiful flowers. Um, and our, our roses, we have a couple different um, roses. This is a Virginia rose, hot and dry, good drainage, no fuss, no muss, simple flower, lots of pollen in there, little to no nectar for pollinators, but they really like the pollen and they really use the pollen. And this is gonna be a runner. You plant it, expect it's gonna spread, expect it's gonna layer, it's gonna send down a stem and, and root into the soil. Just expect that from this plant, um, but uh, very disease resistant and a workhorse. Um, one of my, did I say favorites too many times? I'm sorry. One of my favorites for a um, shady garden, part shade garden, purple flowering raspberry. This is a shrub. This is a bush that gets to be about six feet tall, usually wider than tall. Um, it's quite variable. It does not layer. It does not form thickets the way that some of our other brambles do. It will thicket, but it, it stays contained within its unit. It's not going to throw down a, a, a stem and then root into the soil like um, so many of our other brambles do. But this um, has very, very few thorns. It's virtually thornless and these big showy flowers and it is gorgeous. So. Um, moist condition in a part shade situation, it is wonderful. And think about those layers in your garden when you're doing this. You want the structure of the canopy trees, the understory trees, the shrub layer, and the um, herbaceous layer with perennials, sedges, grasses. Some of us have the right conditions for this uh, wonderful native viburnum, not very well known, maple leaf. It demands acidic soil, it demands. Under 5.0 is really where it wants to live. It's tolerant of drier conditions and it isn't browsed the same way by deer as some of our other native viburnums. Um, and 
um, most of our viburnums um, need a pollinator partner to, um, uh, to produce fruit. And even if they don't require it, they'll fruit better if you have a genetically different match. A lot of information about that on my website. Um, here's viburnum nudum. In my experience, this is less troubled as is the maple leaf viburnum by the viburnum leaf beetle that's started to become a big problem. Um, and oops, misspelling, my apologies, but that uh, it has beautiful glossy leaves followed by fruit. Now, getting into later summer bloomers, um, this is for sale. Uh, a pollinator workhorse, anise hyssop. Who doesn't want anise hyssop in the garden? Very rarely found the straight species. Usually you're dealing with hybrids and cultivars. Get this one. It won't disappoint you. And depending on the genetics of this plant, it may actually be able to take quite, um, a quite a, I won't say quite a bit of shade. Let's call it part sun, happily. Um, with some of the um, hybrids and um, other selections, um, if you don't give them full sun, they'll flop a little bit. So you kind of have to test this out and see what you got. But full sun is a no brainer. If you put it there, it's gonna be really happy, good drainage, and it's gonna bring in pollinators like you can't believe. Sclepia syncarnata, um, different plant. This is also for sale. This is swamp milkweed, which does not need a swamp. Yes, it will take quite wet soil. It will take average moisture quite happily too. This is a clumper. It's going to get to about four feet. All our, our anisysa, by the way, is very deer resistant as this is too. All our Asclepias are deer resistant. Um, it's just a wonderful larval host plant and nectar plant for so many creatures. And um, the plant sale has a, um, a uh, subspecies, pulchra, um, that is uh, even better for wet conditions and a little bit smaller. Um, so check that out too. Um, this is endangered in some of our states. Uh, Sclepias purpurosans, purple milkweed has very uh, many of the same attributes as the common milkweed, but it's a little bit better behaved. Hard to, um, hard to keep going if you're a grower. Uh, they uh, germinate and then they kind of poop out. So we need to protect some of these, but uh, in the absence of that, you can pick up uh, another plant that's not often found for sale as a live plant, usually just seed. Sclepius uh, syriaca, our common milkweed, um, a more aggressive plant. Um, it's going to spread, know that. In a tidy little tiny garden, this is not really uh, a good choice, um, but it's fantastic um, uh, elsewhere, particularly if you've got some uh, invasive pressure once you get those invasives under control having a, an aggressive native plant like this is, uh, is a wonderful thing. And then for those of us, and by the way, so full sun, um, dryish soil, average soil is okay, doesn't like it wet. There's another one that does not like it wet. This is butterfly weed, fast drainage, sharp drainage. That's what it's looking for. Full sun, doesn't like a lot of fertility, too much organic matter, it's dead. Um, and this is a taprooted plant, so it doesn't always transplant well. These are great from plugs, and look at that action on them. And, you know, two, three feet tall, depending on uh, the genetics. Um, here is a subshrub called New Jersey tea that is grossly underutilized. It's a little tricky to get going. Full sun, poor soil, not a lot of fertility, good drainage. And this little guy, um, up to three or four feet tall, typically, um, will attract a ton of pollinators. And then, of course, we all know Clether onifolia. Um, this is one of our reliable deer resistant plants for a part shade, part sun. It's a wetland plant. It does appreciate some good moisture. Um, and the straight species can get up to six feet or more. Um, most of the cultivars are much smaller, but, you know, I love that one. Here's one for sale in the uh, plant sale. This is Eupatorium hyssopifolium, hyssop leaf, uh, hyssop leaf bone set. Um, hot and dry conditions, good drainage. The uh, butterfly weed will like it very uh, much the same way, um, This, uh, the same conditions that this one likes, underutilized. When you're picking plants, think about the size of the flowers too. So some of the really big flowered um, plants um, are easier for some pollinators than for others. When you've got these little tiny florets, get a lot of action from those little bees and other pollinators. So um, I think these are underutilized. Really good one, very rarely found for sale. Another one for sale, Eupatrium perfoliatum. This is common bone set, another grossly underutilized plant. Um, this is a wetland plant that doesn't need a wetland. Um, average moisture is fine with it. 
Um, I find that with lots of moisture, it'll take full sun, but I use it a lot in a part sun condition with average soil, average moisture, um, and um, very deer resistant again, um, as all the eupatorium and eutrochiums are, and uh, really pretty. And um, I think, again, underutilized. Um, the eutrochiums used to be called eupatoriums. You'll probably still see them um, named that way in some nurseries, but um, they're a wonderful group of plants, highly deer resistant and quite variable. So there are three eutrochiums for sale uh, in this particular sale, um, purple ram, maculatum, and adubium. So the purple ram, um, that is more frequently found in, in more of an upland setting, meaning not a wetland. Um, light shaded woods is typically where you're going to find it. It'll take plenty of moisture too, but um, you know, kind of an average moisture is just fine for this guy. Um, and um, with most of these plants, the more sun they get, the more moisture they're going to need. Uh, the height of these, uh, four to six feet, probably hard to say. They can get even taller than that. Some of these things get quite ginormous. Um, Eutrochium maculatum. This is spotted Joe uh, pieweed. These are uh, about, uh, you know over five feet tall. Typically, they're big, um, and they're typically found in cooler settings around stream banks and wetlands. Um, they're uh, they've got some flexibility, um, part sun, part shade. And if you bring them out to full sun, you're going to have to ramp up the moisture. And the last one, I'm not going to show you a third picture, um, but Dubvium is the smallest of the three, and that's under five feet. Um, Heliopsis helianthoides, another one of these endless workhorses that is in bloom, it seems like forever. Um, the straight species uh, can get kind of big, they can get up to a good five feet or so. Um, very open access for many different pollinators, um, wonderful workhorse. And this is for sale, hibiscus mishuto, swamp mallow, rose mallow or swamp mallow, also known as hardy hibiscus, this is the real deal. Um, these guys, you know, they like moist soil and they like um, a good amount of sun. Um, they are prone to um, attracting Japanese beetles. So um, what I found out from a grower last year is that he co-plants them with some allium, some onions, uh, to deter the Japanese beetles. Really fantastic approach. So these are big, you know, um, I just planted uh, some little guys last year and they, within the season, they are up to five feet tall. And they're just beautiful. And hummingbirds do appreciate um, those flowers as well as other insects. Another one for sale that is not often found is Latris novae anglii, northern blazing star, a button formed of blazing star. And you see where it's living, hot and dry, good drainage, sandy soil would be great for it. Um, it's a tough plant. If you fuss and muss over it, give it too much organic matter, it's not gonna be happy. But Fortunately for you, the Leatris spicata is also for sale, and that will take um, much moisture conditions. It doesn't need a marsh. Average moisture is fine. It will appreciate, you know, moisture beyond that as well. And um, these uh, blazing stars um, are beloved by, um, uh, by butterflies, uh, and these are little skippers, a type of butterfly. Cardinal flower, also for sale, Lobelia cardinalis. It's a plant that wants to be kind of in a part sun, part shade with plenty of moisture. And if it doesn't get enough moisture, it will not persist. It tends to have more of a biennial lifestyle. So it's going to throw some seed and that's the way it, um, it um, persists over time. So if you plant it in one spot, a couple of years later, you'll see it in other spots. Um, and this is a hummingbird favorite. Lobelia syphilitica, kind of a different lobelia, great lo great blue lobelia. Um, sometimes known as blue cardinal flower. Um, and the syphilitica comes from the fact that this was used to treat um, syphilis, not successfully. So a uh, part sun condition, average moisture to moist, not wet, uh, favorite of bumblebees, highly deer resistant as, um, uh, as one of those winners. And we've seen this multiple times, Minarda didyma, highly deer resistant hummingbird plant. This one's for sale. This is the Minarda fistulosa, also known as wild bergamot. Um, and a bee magnet. And this is a runner, so plant it accordingly. Um, one that um, you might not know is horseman, which is, again, more of a biennial lifestyle and reseeds itself around another po uh, pollinator favorite. All the Monardas, deer resistant and really big with pollinators. Anothra fruticosa, southern sundrops. Here's one for the moths. The sundrops tend to uh, bloom later in the day. Some, some of them have blooms open at night and they tend to attract more moths. Uh, that's very useful. Um, drier conditions, full sun to part sun, happy. 
Physostegia virginina, obedient plant. Um, it's obedient in as much as you can bend the stem and it's gonna stay in place, but it is a runner and good for a sunny wet area. And here we come to our pycnanthum of species for sale. This is broad-leaved mountain mint um, and it's a runner. Um, sometimes it can be pretty aggressive. Um, it's not as aggressive as some of our other pycnanthemums, but it's aggressive. Um, very, very showy, very compelling to pollinators of many types and uh, highly deer resistant. And there's some, oh, there's damn honeybees again, sorry about that. Um, Pycnanthemum tenuifolium, narrow leaved mountain mint. This will take a, a bit drier condition. Average garden soil is fine for it, not too dry, moist to average moisture. Um, and uh, look at what's going on there. Um, and this will spread over time, but it's not quite as, I, it is vigorous, but it's not quite as fast spreading as uh, the, some of these other species of pycnanthemum. Um, and it's beautiful, a couple feet tall, highly deer resistant. Pycnanthemum virginianum, this one really wants moisture soil, different leaf, a little bit different flower. These are all great. Pick the one that's appropriate for your landscape. And if in doubt, um, and you can't catch everything I'm saying, take a look at the wonderful descriptions that are online at the Aspatuck Land Trust for all of these plants. Here's another one that's for sale, Rudbeckia lacinata. It is not a cone flower, that's why common names aren't that useful. It is a Rudbeckia. Um, and it is, to my mind, um, the best performing Rudbeckia for pollinators because you get all sorts of action on it. It's a big beast, it can get six feet tall or even taller, and it does spread around. Um, where I see it growing naturally is in part shade to shade in kind of moist soil. It will tolerate more sun with moisture, but it's gonna spread, so expect that. And it, um, once it feeds the pollinators, it's gonna to go to seed and feed lots of birds. Verbena hostata, this is a, a wetland um, or a wet meadow plant um, that is um, really beautiful. Average garden soil is okay too, but don't let it dry up. And um, when we saw that meadowscape shot, that was um, the plant that was in there. Um, and this is just a, a real beauty. And you're gonna get you know um, a few feet uh, out of that one. Another one that's uh, a bit on the taller side is Veronicastrum virginicum, Culver's root. Um, and um, I, I can't say enough things about these guys um, as well as the verbena, a moist, sunny area. And you're gonna be so happy. These are big beefy plants. They're great as a, a backdrop in a perennial garden or in a meadow. Uh, another one for sale, Vernonia novaborosensis. This is near ironweed. It's a big boy. It's six feet tall or more, beloved by butterflies. It will do fine with full sun in moist soil. Got to stay moist. But where I typically use it is in a part sun condition um, and staying on top of the moisture, and it is glorious. Okay, we're getting there, guys. Bear with me. Fall bloomers, Baltonia asteroides, false aster, moist sun. Um, another another one that likes that. Um, a nearby native blue mist flower. It is um, this is an aggressive spreader that can do really really well in uh, part sun or full sun with enough moisture and is late um, blooming for lots of butterfly action. The common bone set we saw. This is still going to be in bloom most typically into the fall. Um, and uh, also for sale is the Arabia divaricata, white wood aster, an underappreciated plant. Um, this is a meat and potatoes plant, highly deer resistant, grows under trees, will take average moisture to on the dry side. Um, even though um, many of our pollinators prefer to uh, feed in full sun, when times are tough or you've only got a shade garden, this is a go-to plant. You'll see a lot of pollinators on them. Um, for those of you who have wet areas and you want a goldenrod type of plant, this used to be a solidago, no longer, flat top goldenrod for sun and moist. And this cool one, boy, I got to tell you, I hope, um, I hope y'all buy this. <laughs> to see this for sale is extraordinary as a plug. Uh, I put my order in, this is closed bottle gentian. It is so cool, part sun condition, good moisture, it's happy. It's close because only these strong bumblebees can get in there to get the good stuff. And so it really takes different types of pollinators to pollinate different types of plants. Um, if you're looking for a woodland sunflower, all of our helianthus tend to be a little bit vigorous. They will spread. This is one for the edge of the woods. It's fantastic. That'll get four or five, maybe in six feet tall. Beautiful plant. 
very accessible to pollinators. This is for sale, Hellenium autumnale, sneezeweed, um, a shorter plant, likes moisture with um, full sun, and um, these crazy knobby cones not only deliver the good stuff, the nectar and the pollen, but they'll provide plenty of seed for birds after they go to seed. We do have some woodland um, uh, goldenrods that um, you might consider if you've got a woodland setting, blue stem goldenrod, not as deer resistant as the sun loving goldenrods, but really beautiful late bloom. Zigzag goldenrod, it'll take a little bit more sun, part sun to part shade. And then um, this is for sale. This is a wonderful goldenrod, sweet goldenrod. Um, it has a beautiful uh, fragrance and, and it, um, it is um, not as vigorous as uh, some of the other sun-loving goldenrods, so it's a little easier to use in a landscape, but full sun, uh, average to dry soil, happy, not very fertile. Another one that's for sale, rarely, rarely do I see this offered, Celadego speciosa, showy goldenrod. It's going to be a little bit taller, a little bit more vigorous than the other, um, and it's named showy because of those beautiful panicles of flowers. And these goldenrods are highly deer resistant and super, super important for pollinators late in the season. We're getting there, guys. Bear with me. Symphiotrichum cordifolium. You'll still see these called asters. Blue wood aster, edge of the woods part sun, part shade, beautiful plant, not as deer resistant as the white wood aster, but still has some good deer resistance and um, really nice coloration. We need to put more asters and goldenrods in our garden. And then the New York, uh, excuse me, the New England aster, uh, Symphiotrichum novae anglii, got a big bushy guy, got four feet, six feet, um, likes sun and moist soil. You can cut it back in June to get a little bit denser. Um, that'll work. Uh, and um, it is a beauty and so important for pollinators. We also have a New York aster, very similar plant, but a little bit smaller, a little let a few flower, fewer flowers. So thank you for bearing with me. I hope uh, you've picked up some good tips and you're excited to, to go plant shopping. And uh, you can visit my website at Eco Beneficial, get in touch with me there. And I sure hope you'll pick up a copy of my book, uh, The Pollinator Victory Garden, a lot of good information supplementing the book on my website. So with that, I will turn it back to uh, our hosts and um, take some questions. Thank you Fantastic. so much. Fantastic. Kim, that was <laughs> remarkable. We do have some great questions here great. for you. So let's start at the top. When is the best time to plant plugs, spring or fall? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, both times work quite well for most species. There are some exceptions to the rule, but if you can get your plugs in, in spring before June, that's like, that's just perfect time. Perfect time. After it gets a little bit warmer, after the soil dries out a little bit, get them in and you're going to see a lot of growth, um, throughout the growing season. Um, and like I said, if mother nature is not delivering the goods in terms of moisture that's required, then you're going to have to help out with that. But properly said, you'll see incredible growth. That bone set that I showed you. So I I planted a lot of that common bone set that's for sale, um, as little tiny plugs, my neighbor's garden. Um, we put that in as one of the many plants and, um, within we planted that Memorial day weekend. Okay. By, uh, September, the bone set was full height. That's remarkable. Not every species will respond that way. So things like Coreopsis, they don't do that well as plugs. Native uh, grasses, you have to have some patience with those. But um, I also do a lot of planting of plugs in the fall. We want to get the plugs in six weeks before hard frost. It's a guessing game with climate change, of course. But six weeks before hard frost, I'm comfortable doing that within the month of September into part of October. You never know what's going to happen. And, um, you know, you'll have great success um, with those too. Um, fall can be an easier time to plant because usually the warm days and the cool nights favor good root development. And usually mother nature has given us some moisture, not always. So we don't have to worry so much about the watering. Next question. Thank you, Kim. So sure. curiosity here, are there scientific studies showing why we should wait Till temps are over 50 degrees for planting. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's just based on, well, not for, for planting is, 
you know, so let me just say this. We plant too early in the spring, then we risk um, frost, right? Which may um, cause some dieback. And I, I had clients last year who were in Connecticut who were like nagging me. When are we gonna get the plants in? It was mid-April, it was too early. And then sure enough, the first week in May, we had a major snowstorm and um, plants that went in um, in early May got some frost damage. So that's part of the equation. But we also wanna think about um, when insects become active too as kind of a key um, to the, um, the temperature and the timing of things. So another question, question here. Um, sure. Our, our person asking the question says, I have a 40 foot terrace and wanted to plant native plant pollinators in containers. Do you think this would be beneficial to well, insects, et cetera? Yes, take my class. <laughs> So this year I'm teaching that class at New York Botanical, excuse me, no, at the Native Plant Center in New York. So sign up and you'll wind up with all sorts of great ideas. So another question, what would you plant next to woodland flocks? Oh gosh, what wouldn't I plant next to woodland flocks, right? So, I mean, you know, polymonium reptans, which is uh, Jacob's ladder is a, is a wonderful one. That hydrophyllum, uh, virginianum, um, uh, I'm just, sometimes I blank out on common names. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> water leaf um, would be a great one. I mean, anything that likes the same kind of conditions is going to be a good candidate um, for planting. But, um, you know, again, think about the succession of bloom too, because we kind of like the Solidago, uh, the uh, blue stem goldenrod, the woodland goldenrod would work well interplanted with that. And then you get the really early and the really late. So we want to think about that too. So another question, Next. Um, yep. Diane is asking, are you saying annuals like Cosmo, Zinnia are not good in the landscape for pollinators? So here's what I'm saying is that we have this little thing called evolution, right? Between animals, including pollinators and our plants. And those evolutionary connections can be incredibly profound in some cases. And sometimes we don't even know that they exist. And I'll give you a case in point. Um, until 2015, we didn't know that swallowtail butterflies were the absolute best pollinators of native flame azalea. It's a nearby native. And those butterflies have a behavior called wing pollination. They flap their wings when they're nectaring and they release a lot of pollen. They go on with that pollen to feed on the next flower and the next plant. We didn't know about that connection until 2015. So there are a lot of things we don't yet know. We know that 25% of our native bees are specialists on certain native plants. So if we continue the conventional gardening practices of using non-native species that did not evolve here, we lose so much ecological juice in our landscapes. So I ask you this, next fall, take a look at the Japanese knotweed, one of our, well, I'll just call it the worst invasive plant in my neck of the woods here, right? Japanese knotweed. You'll see it in bloom. It's a lovely plant, looks beautiful, except for the fact that it's an ecological disaster and suppresses the growth of so many of our native plants that would be there and creates huge colonies. Look at Japanese knotweed and see if there are bees on it. So I often hear this from, from beekeepers because I teach uh, native gardening for beekeepers. It's kind of a twist. And I tell them, just because a plant attracts pollinators doesn't make it a good ecological choice, mm -hmm. including that Japanese knotweed, which is beloved by pollinators. Pollinators are opportunists. Birds are also opportunists. Why do you think we have so many invasive plants that are being spread by birds? Because they'll eat what's available. If you don't provide our native viburnums, fantastic source of fruit for birds um, late in the season or um, that Lindera benzoin, and the spice switch. If you don't provide those sources, those birds are going to the, the non-native invasive sources and spreading it. Mm -hmm. So evolution really does matter. Um, and if a plant is uh, frisky, even if it's not on the invasive list, um, like a butterfly bush, <laughs> um, that makes it, does not make it a good ecological choice. So we have to get more, uh, we have to like, really drill down a little bit more about what it means to uh, support the environment. And that means understanding the nature that's around us and what they need. Buy my book. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm a shameless plug, but I'm telling you, I lay out these principles really clearly. So it make it hopefully it will make sense to you. I think it does. Thanks, Kim. Okay. So sure. next question. I'm deliberately planting one native flowering tree in our front yard. Any favorites or recommendations that are both beautiful and support the environment? 
Absolutely. Right after you get your site analysis done, you email me and I'll make some suggestions, but you got to do that work first. You got to tell me how many hours of sun. You got to tell me what the moisture of the soil is. You got to do your soil test and don't feel badly. I make all my clients do this too. <laughs> there we go. Aren't I awful? I know. <laughs> well, Kim, I, thank you I, for uh, making yeah. yourself available. It's <laughs> remarkable, as I said before. Okay, so do you have any recommendations for native privacy trees that grow up to six to eight feet tall? So again, it totally depends on your landscape condition. So, you know, what I, I don't want to do a disservice to you to give you a suggestion of something that isn't going to be suitable for your landscape. So it really does depend on the soil texture, on the soil moisture, on the pH, um, the amount of sun, et cetera. So again, for those specific questions, I, and I mean it, if, if you guys get in touch with me uh, through my website, I'll be happy to answer those questions, but you, you got to start thinking about what wants to live in your landscape, what will succeed in your landscape, not just what's out there randomly grabbed. And another question. That's why we have so many plant failures. Sure. Exactly. Plant collectors, as we all are. Um, yeah. Another yeah. person is, is asking a question regarding the butterfly bush. Are there specific natives you recommend to replace butterfly bush? Sure. So I call in my book, I call it um, butterfly bush knot. I also call it nectar bush because that's what it does. It is just a, it's a source of nectar to butterflies. Now, we all know, hopefully at this point, after all of the um, news about the monarch butterfly and its association with its host plant, uh, group of plants, Asclepias, milkweeds, we now know that, you know, uh, most of us, that the majority of uh, butterflies and moths, they need um, host plants, right, in order to create the next generation of um, butterflies or moths. And some of those host plants feed different species, and some are very specific, like milkweed is the, it's the host plant for monarchs, period. But many of our other plants feed multiple types of uh, butterfly and moth caterpillars. Um, Doug Tallamy's book, Bringing Nature Home, you know, he addresses this quite specifically. And so oaks, for example, are, even though they're not flowering, support over 500 species of butterfly and moth caterpillars. So why am I telling you all this? Um, because the um, butterfly bush is kind of an ecological um, trap. We bring in butterflies, here's good nectar, drink up. And then when the females are pregnant, they're looking for the host plants to lay their eggs on. And if you just have butterfly bush and you don't have the, a, a, a numerous array of host plants in your landscape, you are not gonna support the next generation mm -hmm. of butterflies. And that goes for moths too. So it's, you know, it's, it's a bit deceptive. Like I said, pollinators are opportunistic as well as birds, they're opportunistic and they will go to the resources that are there. And if you've got a dog and you've ever seen your dog go after somebody that, you know, somebody's ice cream cone that just got dropped on the ground, you know, your dog's an opportunist. <laughs> so they're not thinking to themselves, is this good for me? Is this, you know, so we, we have to be a little bit smarter um, to help the nature around us and make better plant choices. Thank you, Kim. A question about replacing right. soil requirements for prickly pear. Yeah, dry. Um, good drainage, so you're going to have uh, some additional element of sand in there. Um, a clay soil will kill it in a heartbeat. So really good drainage, hot and dry and infertile, low fertility, not a lot of organic matter. So we're coming into the end of our questions here. We have two more for you. Thank you okay. so much, Kim. Uh, uh, one person is saying, I have a lot of trout lilies, but almost no bloom. Can you yeah. help me understand so why? Yeah, so you're looking at probably one massive colony of those things and um, uh, not just like many, many different individual plants. And so they're a little funny. They don't start to bloom until they have two leaves on a given plant and, and they can be a little tricky. So you might want to thin out a little bit and see if that um, perks them up. Fantastic. And another question um, regarding soil testing. Sure. Uh, when someone had um, received their soil test, it didn't have the percentage of organic material. Yeah. So um, I frequently use University of Connecticut for soil testing um, mm -hmm. for clients in the tri-state area because uh, they're really reliable. And so you have to choose the additional tests for soil texture and for soil organic matter. So you'll see on their website, there are choices for those two tests. And you, you just give them a little bit more soil 
to accommodate those additional tests. Mm. And skip the, um, skip the homemade soil test, it's not worth the money. And by the way, skip all the fertilizer recommendations that you will receive when you get your soil test results. There's still kind of an old world thinking, <laughs> right? In a lot of these extensions in terms of soil. So with clients, my goal is to work with the soil that's natively occurring and improve its soil health. And that means actually building up the soil biology, the, the creatures that are living within it. And that's where all of this is going to really understand the complexities of the creatures that are living in our soil. It said um, over a billion uh, microorganisms are living in a teaspoon of soil, which is pretty extraordinary. So not a couple, couple things, just since you asked, don't step on wet soil that really harms soil biology and will compact the soil and eliminate all of those wonderful uh, air pockets that soil needs to stay healthy. Um, do not uh, work your soil. We want to be as no dig as possible. Um, and um, what else? Um, and don't walk in it. Don't when there's con uh, construction around um, your house. Uh, really set up paths and deter with, with um, uh, either barriers or tape, deter the contractors from accessing all parts of the garden, which they will do, including your base of your trees, um, just to keep people off that. Compaction is the enemy of healthy soil. So um, anyway, I'm not sure I answered the question, but. <laughs> well, and I, think, I think the question, Kim, too, is in the absence of having checked that box, if you've received your soil, Yes. back is there a way to determine soil uh, texture and organic yeah texture? i mean there are well, organic matter not so much not so much i mean yeah. you can like, a guess about what's i mean oftentimes just look at indicator plants that are existing there will tell you a little bit of something or i think that what is not there you know absent deer um will tell you but you know it's not expensive like 20 or 30 bucks you can do this so just just do another soul test that was back and do it terrific and yeah. so a couple of more that have popped up here sure. and then we will round it out um and close out our questions what would be a good native plant or good native plants for the trail next to the sawmill river Okay, same answer. I know I, I'm like brutal on this. You gotta, you, I have to know more. I, I never give rec plant recommendations without knowing the specific site conditions. Mm -hmm. So, sorry. <laughs> well, and, and again, thank you for making yourself available. So I'm sure people here will yeah, respond well. Yeah, give me that info and I'll, I'll do the best that I can. But, um, you know, to become a native plant gardener, um, you're going to have to get used to a little research. And um, that's kind of how it is. And there's some very credible sources out there. Um, and if anybody would like um, some recommendations, again, get in contact with me and I'll point you in the right directions where you can learn more about this stuff. And take my, I have a class starting, actually I have a class starting Sunday. It's full, but I'll be repeating that class um, throughout the season for New York Botanical Garden. It's uh, gardening with native plants. And we go through a lot of this stuff, the, the basics of how to do this, which everybody needs to know. Kim, thanks so much for that. My pleasure. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah, absolutely. And and we do have one other great question here. Okay. Um, about soil uh, sample testing. Uh, the question was about. Um, I assume it's different makeup in different sections of the yard, even in a small 50 by 100 foot plot, do you send in more than one sample or multiple? That's a, that's a great question. So um, usually in any landscape that's, you know, a typical suburban landscape, I'm not gonna be looking for more than two samples, um, but any, any area that's distinctly different from another area in terms of particularly what's growing there um, would be good to do as a discrete test. Now. When you're converting lawn, and please all of you, I'm counting on you to convert some of your lawn and use some of these native plants. Lawn is, um, lawn likes kind of a higher pH. And typically when you test the lawn, the area where the lawn is, it's gonna test much differently than say your woodland edge. So definitely do those separately. But if you've got rock outcroppings, um, those rock outcroppings may um, impact the soil around that area and, and really result in a different, um, a different type of acidity and nutrients, et cetera, than say another part of your landscape. But usually in most landscapes, no more than two areas. And also we'll remind people that there are excellent instructions at the Yukon Soil Yeah, yeah, they're great. To look at and, uh, and be aware of. So thank yeah. you, Kim, so much. 
And with this, passing it back to Mel. You still there, Mel? Yes, I'm still there. <laughs> I am still there. Hanging in there, Mel. My yeah. mind is officially blown. <laughs> <laughs> Extraordinary. And to everybody that signed up um, and, and registered, this is recorded. Yay. So um, I definitely need to watch this a couple of times because there's so much great information. Kim, that was extraordinary and such a great help for us um, for the plant sale. So I encourage everybody, uh, if you're seeing my screen here, just go to our website. The plant sale is right on the front page um, and take the time to read through the descriptions that, um, yeah. that are there for the plants. And, and they've all been checked and double checked by Kim. So I know that they're right. And the spelling I think is right too. So this was just great. It was like a walk through the candy store for me. <laughs> all of us uh, who love our native plants. So um, thank you again, Kim. Uh, this is incredible. And my thought is that I would love to have more of these during the year uh, from Kim because we sure. just can't seem to get enough of her. So uh, I, lo I love what I do and I appreciate this. And I do want to say one thing to everybody who's remaining is, it, you know, you don't really know a plant till you've killed it. And that is, <laughs> and that is, and I, maybe I'll regret saying that, but don't be afraid, try it and you will learn. This is a lifelong learning process. So don't, you don't have to get it perfect. Just go and do it. <laughs> Great, and on, and on that note, let's uh, we'll all give it a try and um, we will try these beautiful plants. And thank you so much for sharing your pearls of wisdom with us. We really appreciate it today. Thanks, Kim. Thank you. Bye-bye everybody. Thanks right. for coming. Bye.